a step-by-step -step flower painting foxgloves tutorial. That's what I've got for you in this video. Welcome back to the channel. If we have not met before, my name is Michelle. On this channel, you'll find all things watercolour, as well as drawing, mixed media, even a little bit of business and motivational stuff for artists too. Please do consider subscribing. If you click the bell icon, you get notified every time I have a new video for you. I make at least one free video a week here on YouTube on a Thursday with extra content for Patreon subscribers. So in today's video, I'm going to take you through a step-by-step -step painting. We're going to paint a beautiful stem of pink foxgloves. I say pink, they're kind of pink purplish. And I'll be telling you about all the materials that you need to use. I'll be giving you some colour alternatives. So don't worry if you haven't got exactly the same materials as me. You can still follow along with this tutorial. Now do be aware that I filmed this tutorial over a number of weeks because I was working on a larger painting and if you want the full painting tutorial you'll have to join my lovely Patreon community where you can get the entire painting step by step which is going to concentrate on one stem in today's video and because I filmed it over a number of weeks you may see things change. I may change my nails, my hair, my outfit, who knows what might happen it's a, uh, a magical mystery, right? But we're going to go step by step through this painting. I'm going to show you every stage, including the drawing. I'm not anti-tracing, but I don't do tracing on my channel because learning to draw is really, really important. So I'm going to give you all the tips you need in order to, uh, to draw this stem of foxgloves today. So I'm not putting hate out there to anybody that, uh, that does trace. I know it's a bit of a contentious issue, but I would like you just, as well as if you are doing a bit of tracing, I'd also like you just to start to improve your drawing a little bit, which is why I'm going to help you today to learn to draw as well as to paint. You're going to find it a really, really easy subject. There's a lot of leeway in plants. It's not like painting a person. You don't have to make it exactly the plant that you see in front of you. As long as it looks like foxgloves, it's going to be absolutely fine. So don't obsess about it looking identical to mine. Just enjoy yourselves. Paint along if you wish. I'm going to point the camera downwards now and we'll get started. So let's start with the drawing. Really important to get the stem in place here, even though you won't see much of it in the finished picture. So here's the photograph I'm going to be working from. I'm going to be doing this stem here. Now I am using Fabriano Artistico watercolour paper. I've got a De La Roni um, 3B sketching pencil and I've got a De La Roni firm putty rubber. I've also got some paper towel here so that I can lean on this and um, not smudge up my drawing because I'm taking a botanical approach today so I don't really want a load of muck on the paper because the background is probably not going to be um, painted in any major way. Now the larger painting of this also has some white flowers in but for the purpose of this YouTube video we're just going to be concentrating on these ones here. Now when it comes to drawing something that's really important for a stem of flowers like this and these are little sort of mini florets you can't see you can't see the stem you can only see it as it comes up here and you can see it as it starts to emerge the other side here However, if we draw it separately like that, it's not going to look like, um, like one plant. So what I would always do is draw the shape of the stem first and just take it right from here, right the way down. Because this is part of a larger composition for me, I'm going to put it slightly over to one side and angle it a little bit more inwards. But of course, if you're just painting this one stem of flowers, it's okay to have it fairly central on your paper. So I'm going to be thinking about making a mark for where I want the top of the uh, the flowers to come to. I'll say about here, and then I'm gonna take it right off the bottom of the paper. And I'm just going to take my pencil and just curve it down. So I've started now making that line into more of an actual stem. And I'm drawing quite lightly on this part here because it won't be showing in the end anyway, but I just want to get an impression of where things go. And you can see I've gone much wider at the base here. Really important with things that grow, they always get narrower as they come up from the ground with the exception of things like cacti which behave in all sorts of strange ways. But when it comes to ordinary plants, you want to narrow things as you come to the top. It'll give it that sense of height above us. And then I'm going to start just looking at where these, uh, these flower heads sit and start looking at some of these shapes here. I'll also consider you know, how far down I want these white yellow ones to come before they start getting some color. I'll also get you know, maybe an idea, just sort of, um, I'm just gonna kind of sketch almost an outside shape to the head of flowers and that will stop them becoming sort of out of control. It'll give us that nice shape to the outside and help to really make it all hang together rather than just being, again, disjointed. 
So I've got my overall shape, looks a bit like a lollipop. It's going to be easier for me to start drawing from the top because the, uh, the larger florets fit under the ones in front. So I want to draw top down. However, if I just start drawing at the top here, I could easily come far too far down and find I haven't, you know, left enough room to fit the rest of those things in. So I'm looking here at the sort of break point between the pink and where the flowers are more white. And I'm seeing this line of three here. So when I look at this as a whole, if I divide the, uh, the, the whole flower head up into half, it's a bit above halfway. So what I'm going to do is just put that line there and then I'll start drawing these flower heads here. And you see how useful it is now to have these bits here because although we can't see the stem, we at least know that everything is coming from the stem. I mean, there are little, you know, there are little stems that come through. So it's not, they may not reach entirely the stem, but we're, we're looking at this here. And I'm thinking now of putting these ones in and starting with these first shapes. And I'm starting with this one here and starting to draw. When it comes to drawing the opening of them here, I'll be looking at them almost like abstract shapes. You see how straight the top edge here is. They've got this real top straight edge and then these bits at the bottom. These curve round and then you've got this little bit of a point down here. Of course, they all vary slightly. This one is tipping up. You can also look at the negative shape. For instance, here, you can look at the negative shape of the opening here in order to get them right. So as I come up here, I'm putting one behind the other and I'm starting as well. Where I come to these guidelines, I'm starting to get rid of them now. And if I take something over the top of something else, I'm getting rid of the lines underneath. And in this painting as a whole, I'll actually be painting all of this stem before I put other stems in. And that's just so that I don't get lost in the drawing. And it's a very useful thing to think about when you're doing botanicals. So I'm coming up. Do you see how these little ones here are literally half or less of the length of the ones in front. So it's really important that we get nice large ones down here and smaller. And of course, these ones in the front are even bigger. So I'm going to continue going up. Let's look at the one above it. And again, they become much more rounded in shape and much more foreshortened. And so you might be sort of thinking to yourself, well, it's long and thin, but actually have a look at the outside shape of it. And consider if you traced it, you know, what would be the shape of it? Would it actually be long and thin anymore? Chances are that now that we're looking at it, it's foreshortened and it's also a smaller bud because it's grown later on the plants. Then we get to the impression that it's actually very short indeed and drawing those little green bits around the outside too. So I'm going to continue now and do the top part of this stem before moving down to the larger flowers. So I've drawn the top part of the stem. I'm going to come down now and consider these uh, these lower florets and see how large they are. There aren't that many and you can see that they almost go in this kind of um, spiraling or brickwork pattern. So I'm going to be looking at those patterns too. I'm going to start with these ones up here and I'm going to start actually by drawing the shape of the ends because that's a much harder shape to draw and it's um, it's almost more important. So I'm going to put this one under here and always looking you know as I go in for the uh, the area where they head towards that center stem so you know if I drew this one coming up here and then I were to take it to its natural uh, conclusion it wouldn't be going anywhere near this stem in the middle so I always want to think when I'm coming back in about how this floret would naturally come up and connect with the center of the plant and getting that outside shape in as accurately as I can without obsessing over each one, you know, being perfect and um, looking like the exact same one in the picture. We only need the species really to be correct. We don't need to worry too much about 100% accuracy, but I'm just having a look here at how this goes. And as I said, with a mind always to how these join up to the main stem. So here's my flower head in. As I go along, I've cleaned up some of these construction lines. I've tidied everything up. If something went across the front of something else, I've rubbed out the, uh, the bit that I didn't need anymore. And I've got some structure to it. And I've gone a little bit heavier with my lines now that I'm sure that everything is um, placed as I wanted to. The only thing left to do is to put some of these little uh, green bits on the bottom here. And I've already got my stem in place to work from. I can rub out that kind of, um, it's very faint, I don't know if you can see it on screen, but I can rub out that faint guideline for the shape of the flower head now. It was only a rough guide. 
and uh, I'll start to get these uh, these green things in here and where they go over the stem I'll just naturally draw across like that and then rub out the bit that I don't need so that's the last thing to do on the drawing is to get in the greenery so let's choose our colors now I'm going to show you the ones that I'm using but I'll give you plenty of alternatives too there's sure to be something in your paint box that you can use and after all if your flowers are not the exact same color as mine nobody will ever know so let me show you the colors that I'm going to use for this project and I'll give you some alternatives as well in case you have different colors so for my yellow I'm going to use nickel titanate so it's similar to lemon, it's a little bit more opaque and it's a little bit less acid. You can, however, for this project use lemon if that's the colour that you have. So let's swatch that one there. If you are in the UK and you have some SAA colours, this would be similar to their um, primrose yellow, although do be aware that they are currently, I believe, reformulating their entire paint range. So that's the first colour, you're going to need a light yellow. And you don't want a warm cadmium yellow for this one, you want one of the cooler yellows. I'm going to use some sap green for this project. Again, you don't actually have to have a ready mix green if you don't use them. You could add a warmer yellow into your palette and um, use the blue that I'm going to swatch in a minute to mix from. But uh, sap green is uh, quite a common colour, so that's one that we're using here. If you are a complete beginner and you only have Viridian, I would not suggest that you use that unless you can adjust it with something like a cadmium yellow deep or an Indian yellow, not yellow ochre, that's too muddy. But if you can adjust it with one of those warm transparent colours, you might be able to get away with it. But if you don't have the right green, far better to mix your own. I'm going to use Davies Grey here. If you're wondering why these are handwritten, these are because they're manufacturer's samples. This colour here is included in my shadow set of paints. There are um, details of that in the video description. Davies Grey is also a colour that many manufacturers do. They all have a slightly different recipe for it. And it's a rather greenish, soft grey that's great for botanicals. What I do not suggest you use is Payne's Grey. It's far too heavy and there's far too much black pigment in it. It'll make your flowers look really horrible and dead. If you don't have any other mixed greys apart from Payne's Grey, then what I suggest you do is to make your own grey. You'll be able to use your yellow, the pink that we're going to add in a minute and the blue that we're going to add. And you'll be able to mix your own grey very effectively for this project. You do not need a standard one like this one but I have it so I'm going to use it. Next I need a pink. I didn't have the exact shade that I need for this because it's somewhere between pink and violet. If you have a cobalt violet that may work. I have one but it's not a great brand. It's not um, a very clean paint so I actually would prefer. I also had I think a quinacridone violet that was a bit too purple. If you've got something that's too purple you know you can adjust it with pink or you can just go in with pink like this and then we're going to adjust it slightly by putting a little bit of blue in. So this is quinacridone magenta. You could use permanent rose, but you will need to adjust it. Um, I do not recommend alizarin crimson for this unless you've got nothing else because it's just a bit too uh, dark and mucky. You really want either a pink violet or a pure pink like this one that you can then adjust with some blue. I've got this phthalo blue green shade. This is um, Jackman's. Again, these are manufacturer's samples, which is why they're not properly labelled. It's just part of the work that I do with them, helping to uh, design paint colours and to test paint colours for them. You can see as we add it into our pink here, we start to push into more of a violet shade and we'll be able to get the exact shade that we need. As I said, you can also use this blue if you need a different green that's a little bit fresher than this one here. You'll be able to mix this blue probably got some, yeah, I've got some purple in it there. Let's try a bit of uh, bit of pure blue. You'll be able to mix this blue and also get some fresher greens anywhere that you need them. The final colour that I need is for the dark red, sort of purple red in the centre. Now I have selected this one here. This is Perylene Violet, which is going to be just perfect. You can see the sort of colour it is. It's, it's kind of the colour of aubergines or plums as it waters down. You may not have this colour. If you don't have this colour, your next best bet would be an alizarin crimson or a permanent madder rose or one of those deeper pink based reds. I actually would have preferred to put those in with a watercolour pencil or an ink tense pencil, but I simply didn't have the right colour in my selection. 
So those are the colours that we're going to be using for this project. So it's light to dark with watercolours and let's start with the palest area which are those sort of yellow and white areas at the top. So the first step with painting our foxgloves is I'm going to get these sort of light yellow green areas in here and there's one or two whiter flower heads further down that have got sort of a blush of pink but they've also got the uh, a little bit of yellow green so I'm going to pop that in as well so let me show you how I'm doing that so before I start any of this I want to just have a look you know when I'm going in to work on a particular flower head or floret I'm just going to take an eraser in and make sure I've got as much of the pencil out as I can Sometimes you need to leave a little bit more in initially so that you can see what you're doing. But then later on you may find that you're able just to get some out so that there's not too much pencil being trapped under your work. You can see I've got some paper towel here as well. That will enable me, if I have too much water on my brush, I can just wipe that off. So I've got some delineation here and on the one above. So I'm doing this almost in layers, so I'll put a first layer on and then I'll go in later on and strengthen some of those lines and some of those shadow areas. Also, I can just dip into the green and where I want to get a little bit more green in. Don't want to go too mad with the green. And as I come down, we've got these white flower heads that I want to drop a little bit of color into, but I'm gonna keep it soft edge, which means I need to wet first. So let's do this one. So what I'm gonna do is just clean it up a little bit. You want to make sure wherever possible that you're not working next to areas where you've just worked. So move around your picture and I'm gonna drop some clean water in here. So you want this area wet, but you don't want puddles. We'll go in like this and then we can just drop that color in where we see it with no worries that it's gonna leave a hard edge because we've already put some water in there. So I'm gonna go around like this. And I think as well, we'll just get a tiny bit of green. I've just got the lid of the pot here. So using it almost like pan paints and we'll just drop a little bit of green in. If it bleeds too far or moves too much, it means that it's wetter than the surface it's going into. So just dry, brush off and lift some of the moisture out and then you should get a nice effect. So I can go back up to any of those that have dried and get a bit more definition in the shape of them. So I'm going to get a bit of green here. And for example, I can put it inside this little yellow flower here. So I'm going to continue and work on all of these florets that have the light yellow green in. It's important that we get shadows on our flowers, that our colour choices don't kill our flowers and that we layer the other colours over the top of the shadows in this instance. So we're going to get on now and paint some shadows on our little flower heads. So I'm onto my Davies grey now and I've changed my water so I don't have a load of yellow and green in it. I'm still working with two water jars, one so that I can rinse my brush and the other so that I have clean water that's always staying clean. I'm going to look now at getting some shadow areas in. Um, I have had second thoughts about putting a little bit of shadow up the top here. So I'm gonna put some shadow up the top in these areas here that sort of delineate one part of the floret from another, but I'm going to wait a little bit because I think that may be slightly damp. So first of all, we'll go down here. I've got areas like this. So these are the inside of the florets and they're all sort of pink and burgundy. They've got little bits of white in as well. Now where there's white, I don't want to cover up the white completely, but I do want it to get duller and darker as it goes in here. So what I'm going to do in this instance is apply some clean water like so. And as I come up to the top here, I'm going to go in with some shadow color. So we get some shadow inside this floret. Now it may, uh, it may go on too dark, but that's okay because I'm going to clean and dry my brush in a second and we'll just adjust that very slightly. I'm assuming the light is coming from the left here, so I'm going to put a little bit more down this edge as well, like this. And now the brush gets cleaned and dried and we can just sweep around and start adjusting this and getting it wherever we want. You'll notice I'm not leaving any puddles. That ensures that we don't get any uncomfortable drying lines. So that's quite dark, but actually we're gonna have the pink over the top of that and it's not really going to show. It's just going to make the pink even darker. So I'm gonna go up here and anywhere that I think needs a little bit more definition. For example, this one here, I can put some clean water on and then just use a little of the shadow color to define one side. You'll notice the wetter the paint is, the more it runs, and we don't really want it running too much. So I'm gonna keep drying my paintbrush, and I'm going to come up here and manipulate any of these areas. There is actually, um, I don't like outlining things, but there is actually a line on some of these uh, 
these little lights. There's a little bit of shadow between one area and another, so I'm going to go in and adjust those as well, like so. So I'm going to go across now and put shadow in wherever I see it with my Davies Grey. So let's look now at the pink and white areas. So it's time now to put our pinks in and we're going to start doing these areas here. Now some of the ones at the top only have a blush of pink in so I'm going to show you how to do that. You've also got two different areas so we've got the sort of the outside part of the trumpet and then we've got the inside part. I'm going to paint those separately and also paint ones that are touching each other separately so we're going to sort of work on one, go across to another, go back to something that's in a dry area and then continue in that way so that we're not having one run into the other because we're taking a slightly more botanical approach here. And there are hard edges around the outside of these flowers and there are also hard edges between the trumpet and the outside part. So I'm gonna be doing the outside part first. So let's look at the top here. One like this, for example, where we want just a blush of pink on it. So I'm gonna take some clean water on. When I'm doing this, I'm looking all the time at what color we need where in order to show up against the one behind. So anywhere that we need something to show up a bit, I'm going to be putting that area next to it. Now, I've got two colors out here. I've got the Quinacridone Magenta and the Thalo Blue Green Shade. Any Thalo Blue will do at this point, and you could use another blue instead. And I've mixed them together a little bit just so we get more into the, uh, the purple leaning. The pink is a little bit too pink and not quite purple enough. Of course, if you have a color that's exactly right, you can just use that color. And I'm going around here and just getting a blush of color into this flower head up here. So I've just cleaned and dried my brush because I think I want even less than that. I want a tiny little bit here and take that up. I'm gonna go in with just some darker, stickier paint on this edge here because I really wanna show those flowers behind with that crisp edge. So I'm gonna take a little bit darker paint in there, keeping it dry so that it doesn't spread too far and just blending with my brush like so. In other areas we have um, a full amount of colour. Some of it's dark, some of it's lighter. So I'm going to clean up any pencil that I no longer need because the edges are showing via the paint now. I can just clean that out of the way so that we're working cleanly the whole way through. Some of these have um, a lighter area towards the front here. So I'm going to put a little bit of clean water on this one and then just work in above like this. So I'm going to Bring this round. You can see where we've got dry paper, we have a crisp edge, and then we come down, and as it hits that water, we'll get more of a soft edge. A strong color like this will just keep blending forwards if I don't clean my brush. So I'm gonna clean my brush here, dry it slightly, and then just spread a little bit of that forward. And I'm going to get on now and paint the rest of the outside of the trumpets, but I won't, for example, do this one here next because it's touching this one here. I'd lose that lovely sharp edge, it would all bleed across so I'll go across and work on one that isn't touching another one. And in that manner, I'll go backwards and forwards and then come back to these ones later on once the first bits have dried. So I've painted the outsides of all the trumpets. I thought I'd let you know a couple of things I'm doing at the moment. So I'm actually going back in because as well as the outsides and the insides, some of them have this kind of rolled back lip at the edge as well. So I've started painting these. So let me show you what I'm doing here. And some of them it's difficult because some of them kind of curve round and merge into the main body, but there is a hard edge at the top. So I do feel they need sort of painting separately. But in the case of this one here, for instance, we want to paint it separately, but also fade it in at the edges. So I'm just getting rid of any excess pencil. And I'm gonna put a little bit of clean water just on this side and this side here so that we don't have an end to this area. I'm mostly using the pink for this because these tend to be a bit lighter and then there's a dark bit where it curves under at the edge. So we'll start by going in like this and all the time thinking about what's gonna be around it and how much it's gonna show up. So I'm going in with this light bit here. Now you can see that top edge there isn't showing up very much, but it'll be better for me to go dark behind it rather than in front because light colors come forward and that's what we want on this. We want it to be coming forward and um, also, we need to have a bit of dark on the edge like I've done with this one here. because That's going to help to give it an impression that it's rolling over because dark colors recede. If we go darker in that bit there, then what will happen is that will appear to be curving under. So I'm gonna go around like this and get this dark paint in. I want it actually to bleed a bit. I need to put some fresh pink out. I've rather a lot of uh, dried paint here, which isn't uh, assisting me, but 
we can manage. So I'm just going darker along that edge. If I want it to bleed further, I need to use wetter paint. And we can drop it on on the damp edge like that and it will bleed upwards and outwards. So you see I'm manipulating it there. And I'm going to go around and paint any of the ones that have this turned over lip on next before I work on the insides. At this point, as always in the video, if you are enjoying this content, if you're finding it of some value to you, please could I ask you to do me a quick favor and click that like button. It just tells the YouTube algorithm that this is a good video. So if you like, comment, share or subscribe, this video will be pushed out to more people, which helps my channel to grow and means I can teach more people how to paint and draw. I'm so grateful to all of you who watch me on YouTube. So this bit's all about the drama and we're going to get those uh, white and burgundy splodges on the centre of the florets. So what I'm doing next is I'm starting to work on these inside areas. You can see I've done this one here. So what we're going to do is put some colour inside and we're going to fade it lighter as it comes out. When I started filming this video I wasn't intending to use white paint but um, none of the other methods that I have tried as I've gone through this painting have worked in order to get those um, white areas at the front. If you see them here, masking fluid would be too harsh. I was hoping to use salt, but the color is so pigmented it didn't lift out. So we're gonna do a different approach. So I'm going to go in at the top here with quite strong color like this. And of course this is dry, so we get that nice sharp edge underneath that fold there. And I'm gonna lighten this color as I come forward. You can see I've gone a little bit more purple there, a little bit less into the pink. And that's just so that I'll be able to see the difference from one to the other. They did fade here with some clean water, so we can do that again and put some clean water in here and blend everything down. Now you want to work fairly quickly so you don't get drying lines, but to be honest, because we're going to paint all those splodges on the inside, it's not the end of the world. If you do get a few lines, it's looking a bit uneven here, so I'm going to take that water back across so that I even out the water levels whenever you get uneven water levels you will get splodges and back runs and drying lines so I'm going to let that dry and then we're going to put some white on. So I've got some white paint here this is the Jackman's Art Materials Titanium White so you get two types of white paint you get the um, at least in watercolor you get two types you get the titanium white and you get the zinc white sometimes called Chinese white titanium white is a little bit um, more opaque and that's why I'm using it here I've just squeezed out of the tube and it's much easier if you're using white paint to um, get a decent amount of it like this than it is if you've got the um, white watercolour pan paint. I did consider other things to do on this like masking fluid and salt but neither of those um, seemed satisfactory. Masking fluid's a bit too hard edged and salt just wasn't working. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to place some white marks in here. White paint disturbs very easily and we're going to paint on top of it later on as well and it will disturb then if we're not careful. So you're literally just going to place it on making smaller marks as you come forwards and getting that paint as opaque as possible because it will be it won't be fully opaque unless you were using something like a white acrylic ink which might in turn be too uh, too much and we're just going to place these in and all I'm going to do is put those on and let them dry. So you'll notice while I was using the white, I kept it in a separate palette. If you do use white, it's important not to let it pollute your whole palette. It is opaque and it will muddy up all your colors. So um, although I'm not against the use of white paint, it should be kept for specific purposes and not allowed just to um, go everywhere in your painting or in your palette. I kept it separate. I've now got some perylene violet and again I've squeezed out some fresh paint. It's a very strong colour and what I'm going to do is just pop this on top and leave some of the white showing in little outlines. Now these marks, if you see them, they sort of merge together as they go higher up. We can use that to uh, sharpen this edge above and then they come smaller as they come out towards the end. So you need to make sure that your white is fully dry before you do this and then we're just going to dab on like this. And as I said, in places I'm going to allow it to sit in the center of the white so that we get some form of outline. Don't be too neat with this. You know, allow it to become uneven and allow it to join up in places. And as I come up here, what I'm going to do is take that paint round 
and it's going to give drama to that top edge there, like so. Even though there's a small amount of green in this painting, it's going to really, really help to show off those pinks and whites. So let's put our stems and areas of greenery in now. So I'm going to work on my greens now and I'm going to simplify it. If you have a look at these little bits here, what you find is the stem seems to be quite dark. These outer shapes are fairly dark and then the centre bits are a lighter colour. And then we've got these little things that extend that are kind of very, very pale yellowish green in some places almost white or grey. So I'm going to work on these now and keep it really, really simple. Remember with a flower painting that people are much more interested in the flowers. All we want are some nice fresh greens to, uh, to show them off. And I've got my sap green here. If I want to, I can add a little bit of the yellow. I've also got the blue that I can use to darken in places. So I've made sure at this point that I have cleaned my water, cleaned everything, cleaned my paintbrush. I don't want white or red getting in the greens at all because it will kill the freshness, the white because it's opaque and the red because it's the opposite colour to green so we'll naturally dull it down. So I'm going to start with the lightest colour, start with the green and add a little bit into the yellow. I wouldn't normally put it into the yellow like this but I'm not using the yellow for anything else now so it will be fine. And remember if you want a light colour you just need to add more water so putting a little bit more water with that and looking at getting some really light areas for these centre parts here. Don't be afraid to do things quite light because remember that the darks around them will show them up. Bearing in mind that this is a painting that's going to have a white background so we don't have too many darks to show things up but we will at least be able to show them here where they're surrounded by other leaves. I'm going to go in now and do all of those pale areas including some of these little bits that come out here. I'm going to take them slightly darker than they are in the picture simply because it is the only way of having them show up against the background. Some of them have a touch of brown or red at the tips so I can just dip into the dark red and just place a little bit in there. Remembering to be very careful to clean my paintbrush before I go anywhere near the greens. So we're going to get the mid-tone greens in now. It's really important that uh, the first greens have dried because we don't want everything running into everything else. I'm going to use some up the top here and some down the bottom. I'm going to save the darkest green, I believe, for the, uh, for the stem itself. So here, what I'm going to do is just go in with, I've got some of the sap green by itself, just a little bit watered down, and I'm just going to go in and place this where I see it. You'll notice that we have multiple sort of, I can't even call them petals, but multiple areas to these greens here. I'm gonna to need to paint them a few at a time so that the ones next to them have a chance to dry. So in other words, I'm gonna put this in here, but I'm not going to paint this one here until this one has had a chance to dry. I've also cleaned up my blue. It had some pink in, so I've cleaned that up. I'm going to take a little bit of this blue now and use it to darken the green wherever I need it to show up against something else or wherever there's a little bit of shadow. I don't want to overdo this. It's a very strong colour, this phthalo, so I'm just putting a little bit on. There's too much there, so I'm just going to use a damp brush just to lift that out a little bit and manipulate it how I want to. It's very hot in, uh, in my studio at the moment because we're having an unexpected heat wave in the UK, which everyone is complaining about. So about 350 days of the year, the British complain that it's raining and too cold. And then we get some nice weather. And um, what the British like to do then is to immediately change tack and uh, complain about the heat. If, uh, if there was not weather to complain about, I doubt we'd have anything to say to each other at all. The pandemic has stopped us um, meeting in person, so we now complain about the weather um, on the internet. So again, wherever I want any shadow or any little areas to look like they're turning over, I'm going to pop a tiny, tiny bit of the phthalo in. And I'm going to carry on now and get all of those extra little bits, leaves shall we call them, petal shapes, that are at the edge here and leave the stem until last. So I'm going to get the stem in finally. I want it to be really quite strong. I'm not gonna to go too dark with it, but I'm going to mix some of this sap green. I'm gonna get more of the sap green actually and mix some of the phthalo in it so that we're starting with a slightly darker color. You can see that as I added all these light greens, I very slightly adjusted them. 
sometimes with a little bit of blue, but sometimes just by using them weaker or stronger so that everything showed up against everything else without going into too wide a, uh, a range of tones, a range of colours, I should say. So um, let's get a little bit of this blue in and I'm just going to darken this very slightly. I'm not going to go too strong with it because we can add more blue as we go along. I'm actually also going to add a bit of the yellow, which may seem strange if I'm looking for a darker colour, but I'm also looking for here a slightly more opaque colour and the yellow is very opaque, whereas the phthalo, for instance, and the sap green are quite transparent. There's a lot of um, dis, shall we say, a lot of shade thrown at um, opaque paints, but actually they can be really, really useful in watercolour painting because we want the stem to seem much more solid than those flower trumpets, for example, which would be much, uh, much thinner and lighter. So it's important that our stem actually holds the weight of our flower. So I'm going to bring it in like this. And then what I'll do is I'll take some of the dark blue while it's still wet either down one side or down both sides and that will give the uh, the stem just a uh, an impression that it is circular and this is something you can always do a tubular I should say this is something you can always do with stems is take a bit of dark down one or both sides and you will make it look more curved because it curves away from us and so it would naturally have some dark there I'm having to work quite quickly here because of it being so warm and uh, come around like this. Anywhere like this where I'm in danger as well of it being the same colour as what's behind it, we can go in a little bit darker there too. So I've got this first part of the stem in and I'm going to go in to the blue here. Now we said that the, uh, the light was coming from the left so we'll take a little bit of dark down this side here and that gives me the opportunity to take it underneath a bit of plant there. And then what I'm going to do is clean and dry my brush. I say dry, I mean semi-dry. And then I'm just going to take a highlight out down the middle. You see how nicely that lifts out? And then this again will help it to look circular because the curved part is closest to us. It's minuscule, but it's um, it's actually slightly closer to us than the bit that curves away. I'm going to get a little bit of that shadow underneath there as well. And maybe even a tiny bit more dark just for drama down that edge though it's not actually meeting that little bit of stem so let's take that there as well. need a touch more water on my brush and just take this down here. You can nearly always get away with putting blue straight in to green where you want darks. Also going to take some more of it underneath the top here. Because of the weather it's drying a little quickly so I'm just going to even out those water levels, blend that highlight a little bit. And there we start to get a really solid stem for our foxglove and I'll go ahead and put that in all the other places where I can see the stem. So I hope you enjoyed that tutorial. I'll try to put a finished picture up by the, uh, the magic of editing. I'll try to put a finished picture of the whole painting up here. If you would like that full painting tutorial, step by step, and that's four full length tutorials, each stage of that watercolor painting, you can find that on my Patreon channel. I'll leave a link to Patreon in the video description so you can check out the options that are available there. Whilst you're in the video description, don't forget to grab some of those free downloadable PDFs that I have for you for no money whatsoever. You can also find out about all of my online courses. If you enjoyed this flower painting and you would like some more really quick and easy flower painting techniques. I have a whole video about just that subject. I'll link to that video which you can watch right now.